Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Mixtape with Scott, where we delve into the personal stories of economists, scientists, and authors. I'm your host, Scott Cunningham, and I'm delighted to have you join us today. In this episode, I have the honor of interviewing the remarkable Jason Furman, an economist with a truly unique career path from his work with the Council of Economic Advisors in the Clinton administration, while he was pursuing his PhD to his time in the Obama administration, and now his position at Harvard Kennedy School, Jason's journey has been one of a kind. We explored in our interview his life from childhood to the present. I uncovered a lot of fascinating stories that I think you're going to really enjoy hearing, like his upbringing in Greenwich Village in New York, his high school days where he was a street performer and a juggler, and his deep passion for economics. We discussed his experiences in his doctoral program, working with renowned mentors like Greg Mankiw, Joseph Stiglitz, how he forged his own path in the world of economics. I really enjoyed our conversation for a lot of reasons. Not, not only was it engaging, but it, was, it also provided a fresh perspective on how a PhD in economics can lead to lots of different opportunities outside, even ones outside of academia and industry. Jason's story is a valuable example of the of different paths that one can take in this field. And I, and I really think it's important to share these stories to help illuminate the potential directions a career can take. So without further ado, let me introduce you to this interview with the extraordinary Jason Furman. Sit back, relax, enjoy the conversation. And as always, please share, like, and subscribe to the Mixtape with Scott so you don't miss out on any of our inspiring guests. Thanks for tuning in. Okay, well, it is a pleasure to have on the um, uh, the, the podcast this week, a uh, person that I've not had a chance to personally meet, but have followed his career for a long, long time, uh, Dr. Jason Furman. Jason, thanks so much for being on the uh, podcast. Great, I'm thrilled to be here. And, and I came on the condition that I wouldn't get quizzed on causal inference. <laughs> okay, deal, deal. You, that's right, that was, a, that was the under the table uh, side payment that was done. Uh, okay, so for the sake of the listener, could you introduce yourself with your name, your job title, and who pays your paychecks? Um, so my name is Jason Furman. I'm the Aetna Professor of the Practice of Economic Policy, and I'm joint at the Harvard Kennedy School and in the Department of Economics at Harvard. Okay, cool. All right, so you get you get two paychecks. So Harvard, like Harvard Kennedy, mm -hmm. and then Harvard Econ, right? Uh, well, they each give me sort of half a paycheck from each. Okay, half a paycheck from each. All right, great. All right, well, so more than half, maybe have more than half the work for each, but uh, that's another <laughs> story. My fault. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we're going to start with an icebreaker. So can you share a special memory or tradition from childhood that involved family, parents, siblings, extended family, that has stayed with you over all these years and why? You know, we used to do a lot of hiking and time outdoors. And if anyone found anything interesting, you know, a new animal that we hadn't seen before, an interesting plant, something like that, they'd yell out explorage. And no matter how far away you were, you had to sort of come back and all gather around and look at the thing um, that was explorage. And I do that with my own children today. I'm not sure why that was the first thing that came to mind, but but it was. What's explorage? Something you've never seen before? Explorers, you know, I mean, never seen it before, or it's like an interesting frog hopping along and you have oh. to run to catch it before it disappears or, you know, some sort of fern that looks interesting or just whatever it is, some natural phenomenon. You'd yell explorage and everyone would have to come sort of look at it, talk about it, pause whatever they were doing before moving back on again with their did you Who'd you do that with, your siblings or your parents or both? Uh, my father was the one that started it. Oh, okay. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess maybe I should have had a more economic story, which I haven't done this one as well um, in terms of continuing it. But we also have, used to have a concept called peril, which is, um, you know, wanted to encourage us to experiment when we were eating, uh -huh. but also wanted us not to like over order in obvious ways that was going to be a waste. Uh -huh. And so at some point, if you were ordering too much or eating too much bread, my father would call that peril. And at that point, if you didn't finish what you had, you had to pay for it. And until oh, it was called, um, you you sort of wouldn't have to pay for, for anything you didn't eat. So you were encouraged to experiment. But if you're taking it too far, um, you'd bear the cost. Peril. 
Farrell. That's yeah. great. Yeah. So where did you grow up anyway? I grew up in uh, Greenwich Village in New York City. Oh, fun. You that's That had to have been fun. So you were taking like the subway and stuff. I took the public bus to school starting when I was about eight or nine. Oh my uh, gosh. On my own. It would be, be about a three mile trip. And I started taking the subways alone probably when I was about uh, 12 or so. Oh. Um, for a while there, I'd be getting cab money to get back from bar mitzvahs at night. Yeah, uh, and I would take the subway and and pocket the money, and you know, no one would be the wiser. Oh, was that just such an adventure as a little kid, just being out in the city like that? Yeah, New York. I mean, I yeah, new growing up in New York is yeah, no, it's it's an it's an adventure, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. So, what'd your parents do for a living? My father was a real estate developer, and mm -hmm. before that, he was an aspiring. Um, professor of law and economics, taught for a couple of years at Yeshiva University and never finished his economics PhD. Oh, wow. But I was always very enthusiastic about it. And my mother was a psychologist, uh, mostly a school psychologist when I was growing up and then more of a private practice later on. Mm -hmm. Wait, so your dad was working at Yeshiva, but he had was like ABD at a different school? Yeah, he had a law degree. He was a professor of law, was also doing a PhD in economics at the same time. Mm. Um, but then he dropped out of all of that to go into our family business, which was, uh, you know, from his father was real estate development. Oh, wait, where was he doing his PhD? At Columbia. At Columbia? Um, so when would that have been? That would have been like 70s? That was the late 60s, early 70s. Oh, okay. So that's like the beginning kind of that like Kosian uh like that emerging law and econ type of work of like coast and posner and all those guys is that right no yeah no it's very early in all of that and uh and you know he was very enthusiastic about it very creative about it oh. but ultimately you know felt he had a responsibility to to his father yeah uh, to to continue on a different you know to move on to a different path so what there's this there's this bi this family business that your grandfather started that was what real estate development yeah, my grandfather was an immigrant from Russia or Ukraine, uh, to be more precise, um, came in uh, when he was, I don't know, 10, 12 years old. And then eventually he just sort of, you know, did one small business and then another small business, then bought a mm. piece of property, then bought another piece of property. It's not an atypical Jewish story from 100 years ago mm. and, uh, that, uh, you know, that that developed in New York City. Uh, mostly, uh, mostly in a variety of places around the country, mm. uh, mostly, mostly retail. Huh. Did you get to know him pretty well? Um, I got to know him pretty well. He lived until I was like around 19 or 20 till I was in college. So he hit your dad. Did your dad kind of always know probably this would be what he wanted to do? Or was it something like in y'all's culture of your family, there was just the 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 bot the ties of family made it where that was probably going to happen you know a lot of it was actually the the high interest rates in the late 70s and early 80s basically looked like it was going to bankrupt um this business oh. my father had a lot of skills in terms of law and economics and went in temporarily to help sort of cope with this situation yeah and ended up you know, finding it very rewarding and exciting and interesting and, and stayed with it for the rest of his life. So it sounds like your dad and your grandfather sort of have this like natural entrepreneurship slash like business competency. Is that right? I, yeah, I mean, my grandfather had a middle school education yeah. and yeah, he was great at numbers, great at sort of math and logic and, and, and all of that stuff. Just, mm. I don't know got it from somewhere but it wasn't uh wasn't uh you know wasn't wasn't the product of schools right 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 so then you're so so then you're um so so you, your dad switches into this like full-time uh business and that is that what pulled him out of columbia uh that's what pulled him well out of the phd program and that's what pulled of, him out of the out phd of the program law. he was yeah, and out of the law he's teaching yeah so that's what pulled him out of that and uh yeah Okay, cool. All right. So you grow up in Greenwich Village. So uh, uh, do you have any siblings? 
I have a younger brother. Yeah. What is what does he do for a living? If you don't mind me he asking. He's a federal judge in the uh, Southern District in New York. So that was my father was both a interested in law and interested in economics, and I guess neither of his children were went particularly far from those interests. That's right. They like split it. They they say you you yeah. do the law and I'll do the econ. Yeah, and I know no law. Um, I don't want to insult my brother. You can ask him <laughs> if he knows any economics, but I figure he has it covered, so I've never really learned it. Right, right. That's great. Um. Well, so uh, so what were your passions and interests like when you were a kid and in high school? Like, what did you want to, what did you like to do and what did you kind of want to do? You know, I always had a lot of passions. Um, economics was actually one of them from an early age and I'll get mm-hmm. to that, but I'll, I'll do some of the others. Um, you know, I would just get into different things. So I got into um, hieroglyphs, what people inaccurately call hieroglyphics and got a book by someone named Budge and taught myself them and would go to the uh, Metropolitan Museum and, you know, try to decode the inscriptions and read them to myself. So I was always trying to teach myself um, different things. Later on, um, taught myself, you know, an awful lot of Swahili, for example. Oh, wow. So that was a really um, interesting language. Um, but probably the thing other than school, I spent far and away the most time on in high school was juggling. Um, really? I, uh, you know, there was a, I sort of got interested in it. I had a lot of fun with it. Um, I met some other jugglers in New York. We got together twice a week at a gym and just would play music and juggle and pass things back and forth. Um, one of them was, I'd say, the leading performer and street performer in New York at the time. Mm. And um, he taught me his things and I ended up um, doing street performing in Washington Square Park, you know, building some pretty big crowds, unicycle, bowling ball, knives, torches, uh, lots of patter, the whole thing. Wow. What do you think that skill is? I don't know. I mean, some of it was frankly just a lot of time. Uh-huh. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if I spent, you know, two hours a day uh, yeah. doing this for, for several years in a row. Um, there's a certain amount of experimenting. Um, Mm. You know, I'm going to, my, at the risk of sounding like a pyromaniac, um, I thought there'd be a cool thing where I could take the wick that you, a torch is wrapped in, wrap a ball in that, light it on fire. And if I juggled it fast enough, I wouldn't get burned and I could juggle three flaming balls. Um, and I did that and it lasted like 30 seconds until uh, the rubber in the ball started melting and falling into my hand and like burning it and giving me blisters. So mm. um, that ended up not being a viable act to continue with, but I was always just experimenting with like different objects, different weights, different mm. lines and the like. Um, so it was, you know, some combination of maybe some minor set of skill, but a, right. a, lot, of, a lot of practice and experimentation. Yeah. I keep hearing you say experimentation. So it's like, I would have thought, uh, juggling was like uh, memorizing someone else's techniques and learning those skills. But you're saying it's like uh, you were always trying to do something different, I guess, because you're a performer, partly. Yeah. Yeah. And you're trying to just find different objects. Like I um, had one that I ended up doing and I did a show in, you know, in college for my friends. And, uh, you know, I got jello from the dining hall and just juggled that and it fell apart as I juggled it, but you could sort of keep it going for 30 seconds until it sort of liquefied itself and was all over you. So, yeah, you know, just finding different stuff like that. No one told me that you could juggle jello for 30 seconds. Right. What about that stuff makes you happy back then? If you had to guess. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's always fun being good at something and, yeah. you know, and you know, I made a decent amount of money. I mean, my shows, mostly people would pay dollar bills. Um, even then, I mean, one of my lines, which I stole from another performer at the end was, you know, whatever you want to do is fine. You know, nothing is too small. Just take it, fold it up and put it in the hat. <laughs> um, and, you know, I would make probably, I don't know, $25, $30 from a show. If I was in the fountain in Washington Square Park, which was the main arena, which I didn't do that much, uh, I hundred dollars from a show. And, you know, that's I don't know what that is in today's dollars, probably like a million dollars. Um, <laughs> that's right. I don't, I, I'm, that might not be fully accurate. It's <laughs> more accurate usually. Um, 
And I, I met a lot of people through it too. There's a whole, there was, you know, there probably still is. I don't know them anymore. A whole community of people. Now I mostly just entertain my children at their parties every now and then. Yeah. You, you juggle at the parties. They Do the kids let you do that? Uh, they do. And and I'd say the far and away, the most entertaining was um, a number of years ago for my son's party. I decided to take out my torches. I literally had not touched them for 20 years. Oh, God. And no practice, dip them in kerosene, lit them up. Um, I was doing really good for like 30 seconds. Um, then I dropped one. Our lawn was pretty dry. It went up in flames and <laughs> the children just loved it. It was so like, that was awesome. on purpose. It was so much more awesome than like anything else I did was setting our lawn on fire. <laughs> yeah, right. You're like, that's the that's the way I ended every act in Washington Square, guys. Exactly. <laughs> I lit the whole I lit the fountain on fire. That's great. Well, so so when you were in high school, uh, what did when you were kind of moving towards the end? What what, what would your teachers have described you as? I don't know. I mean, I I. You know, I was the sort of student, if I liked something, I did 10 times more of it than I needed to. And if I didn't like it, I wouldn't do any of it. So mm. you know, French class, I just wasn't interested. I did badly in that. Uh, math class, I read, you know, eight books and proved, you know, tons of theorems that we were never assigned or told to do. Right. And, um, you know, so I, I was very, yeah, spent a lot of time, especially with my math and science teachers, my math and physics teacher. Just sort of getting extra work, learning extra things, um, and uh, you know, and the like. I was also probably a little bit annoying and arrogant. I I never took any notes. Um, once my physics teacher told me I had to take notes, so I got a roll of paper towel and started writing on that. Um, you could just hold it in your head, or you were doing so much outside reading. I, I don't know. I I I I don't. I can't really remember whether it was like a parlor trick or I could hold it in my head. I think I could mostly hold it in my head. That didn't last forever. I mean, certainly I didn't get through economics graduate school. Yeah. Uh, with any way other than taking lots and lots and lots sure. of notes, and then after right. class trying to figure out what my notes meant because some of them I wrote down and you know didn't even understand what they were saying in real time. But yeah, no. In high school, I think I was fine uh, with without the notes, just remembering. Well, what about what about was it math and physics that made you happy or were, is it something more general that those things were kind of tapping into? I, I like thinking about the world in a, a logical and precise way. And, you know, partly that's how, what I liked about economics was I cared about the world, yeah. but I also cared about, you know, being very logical and precise in economics for me, was a nice way to, um, and still is a nice way to combine those two. Mm -hmm. But there's a, you know, there's just a real elegance. I mean, I, I'm so far away from theory um, these days and what I do on a daily basis. But there was a time when, you know, I found that really beautiful and elegant. I still do. It just isn't, it isn't really what I do anymore. Right, right. You meant, you're mentioning economics even in high school and you mentioned, you know, your dad had this econ background and, and then also it sounds like you were front and center at some of that Volcker uh, era of the Fed and really high interest rates. So I'm guessing there's a, there's also some kind of econ story in your, even in kind of being a young man. Is that right? Yeah. So um, it, you know, obviously my father's doing a PhD in it, so that gave me some interest. But I was more interested in international relations. It mm -hmm. was um, the early 80s and President Reagan had greatly expanded the Cold War. As a middle schooler, I thought that was really bad. Mm -hmm. uh, and I started doing a lot of research into Central America. I sort of romanticized, probably mistakenly, the Sandinistas in Nicaragua standing up to Ronald Reagan and all that. Um, so I asked a friend of my father's who was actually a political scientist, what, you know, magazine or newspaper he'd recommend for me so I could learn more about international relations and especially mm -hmm. these issues like the civil wars in, in Central America. And he recommended The Economist. Uh -huh. And so in seventh grade, I started subscribing to The Economist. So I've subscribed to it ever since. So it's been about 40 years. You finished even as a seventh grader? You, you yeah, so I started starting seventh grade. And you're finishing you know, the whole thing in a week? And, uh, and no, and I just couldn't understand a lot of the economics yeah. articles. There's a lot of macro implicit in that 
well, they yeah. call it a newspaper, we'd call it a magazine, right. that I just couldn't understand. And I'd yeah. sort of try to work through, try to understand it. Um, eventually, The Economist had a like short guide to economics, like some sort mm. of flip that I ordered from them in high school and, and started to, yeah, teach myself to read that magazine and, and understand that magazine. And that got me, sort of moved me from the, the international relations that was my passion um, towards economics. Mm, mm. Yeah, I've been a long time uh, subscriber, unsubscriber of the economy because <laughs> I uh, I end up with about 15 uh, un, unread uh, magazines because I can't I can't ever finish the whole thing. So I'm impressed. Um, so well, I don't read it cover to cover, but uh, but it's uh, you, I, anyway, I, now I have my order. I go to the finance and economics section first. Yeah. And then I actually sort of might indulge myself in the science or book section uh -huh. and then move back to the leaders and then see what I have time for. Yeah. The yeah. Next. Well, so uh, so you're you're in high school and it sounds like you were already kind of got you have this uh, quasi political science kind of bend inside you, but you're more interested in that in economics. So when you graduate high school, what are you thinking? You know, you, you got this interest in international relations. Where, where are you thinking that you might be heading? Yeah, so I didn't know if I wanted to study math and physics or if I wanted to study economics or something related to politics and economics. Those were the two things in my head. Yeah. At the time, I thought I either actually wanted to be a journalist. I was writing for the foreign affairs we had a foreign affairs publication at my school that I was the editor of and wrote a lot for. So I thought maybe that would be fun or maybe I want to be an academic. Those were my two main interests. Right. And, and you know, went off um, to Harvard. I had done the first year of math and physics at Columbia, the first year. So I went basically straight to the second year sequence at Harvard. Mm. And I would say I did not put in anything resembling the time I needed to for those courses. I thought I could just still not take notes and sit there and not work very hard. Um, and they were super intense courses with super intense people in, in math and science. So I think that was sort of made the decision for me. I see. Um, and then I really liked the, you know, introductory economics class. Yeah. Quite a lot. Um, a class that, by the way, I'm now the co-teacher of. Right. But, um, and so that, you know, moved me it sort of made the decision for me about which of these two tracks I wanted to be on. Yeah, that's a legendary class, right? Uh, I oh, mean, it's called it, it's 10. Yeah, I, I learned it. Yeah, it seems very legendary. Um, yeah, for the last 50 years, there have been um, four people or four teams that taught it for somebody named Otto Eckstein, who was a great economist and also a member of the Council of Economic Advisors. And then Marty Feldstein, who was chair of the Council of Economic Advisors and president of the National Bureau of Economic Research. Um, then Greg Mankiw, who also was both a researcher and chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. And then when he stopped teaching it about um, five years ago, they could not replace him with one person. Um, so they replaced him with two, uh, me and David Labson. And I'm more of the policy world experience. And David is more of the sort of pure scholarship. Yeah. And it's been a, you know, maybe we'll come back to it, but it's yeah. been a real, real joy to teach it with him. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So, you know, you might say we get three separate types of exposures to economics, uh, as economists, we get classes, people, and books. I was thinking that that might be a framework for it. So I wanted to go one at a time. Uh, so it sounds like econ 10, ec 10 was, ec 10, yeah, we call it here. Yeah. Ec 10 was one of these classes, uh, that really caught your eye. W would you say that was, one of the first that would be the one of the first that really caught your eye and imagination or was there a different one at harvard that really caught your eye and imagination the even more no, than that, that really did and then i did a class in sort of the history in economic history slash development with jeffrey williamson mm -hmm. that also was just amazing because it used you sort of general equilibrium models to almost simulate alternative histories, but do it in a rigorous and quantitative way, mm. um, to ask different questions about economic development. And that was so cool to me that um, 
you know, you could, you know, not that you get the truth or you know for sure it's correct, but but that it's a, a rigorous discipline way to look at a topic that you never, I never would have thought you could do something like that with. So that's another class mm. um, that really means a lot to me. Yeah. What about people? What, which people first introduced you to economics and what was it about them that did it for you? Sometimes it's classes, but you wouldn't necessarily say it, in, but sometimes it's not the classes professor, you know? So were there people that really first kind of made a big impression on you? You know, as an undergrad, I just never got to know any of the economics professors very well. So some of them made a difference from a distance, but that really probably falls under the heading of classes, um, mm -hmm. not people. I'd say for people, you know, a formative experience for me is I just spent ridiculous amounts of time um, tutoring my friends in economics in mm. college. And then also I had a lot of friends that I'd say were a decent amount to the left of me and sort of arguing about economics with them and trade and globalization and imperialism and, and everything else. So it was, I'd say the peers, both learning the theory better by figuring out how to explain it to people who had a hard time understanding it, and also sort of learning it better and learning the weaknesses in it better by debating, uh, debating with people. Right, right. Debating well, when I say that, like, like late at night or in the dining hall, not... Yeah. Uh, not an Oxford style debate with winners and losers. Right, 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 right. Yeah, there's some there's something about economics that does invite that kind of vigorous disc, that vigorous exchange that uh, maybe you're not getting in history or or physics even. Um, yeah. And you enjoyed that. You enjoyed that kind of that because that's different, I guess, than what you were experiencing in phys in your physics experiences, right? That kind of intellectual fight, that kind of intellectual exchange. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, and I just had, yeah, a friend, yeah, my friends in college, yeah, tended to be pretty sort of uh, reasonably intensely intellectual. I'd say more of them inclined to things like philosophy and social theory than um, economics. The yeah. economics crowd, when I was an undergrad, and probably still true to some degree, it was more of like a pre business group of people. Ah, uh, yeah, sure. And then it was a sort of, interested in the deeper set of ideas right so i gravitated to the people that were interested in ideas who tended to be peers um who tended to be really outside of economics yeah yeah well, what would books what books did you read that made a big impression on you so um i read a bunch of john kenneth galbraith was some of the first really? things i read and in economics which made an impression on me at the time but i don't think of aged uh, you know, quite as well, but, you know, mm. you should go back and take a look. Um, I read um, The Worldly Philosophers. I mean, I read sort of the standard things. Uh, I read The Worldly Philosophers, which is a, a, um, a history of economic thought, which is just great. Um, it shows how the world affects economists and how economists affect the world. Um, but I was also trying out different ideas. So I read, you know, Capitalism and Freedom uh, at a pretty early age. Uh, I remember like Art Oaken's Inequality, the big trade-off. Um, yeah. you know, what's it called? Anyway, I think that's the name. Like sitting in Lamont Library, one of our libraries, and reading that. You know, I can sort of even picture where I was sitting in the library um, when I read that book. So none of these are particularly unconventional um or off the beaten path things but i think there's a you know a reason they all they all have the had especially then and even now the role they have well so from the time you were a freshman to the time you're graduating college how what's your what's your new vision of of what you would like your future to be and what do you feel like is the next step so i knew i wanted to do political economy mm. um, combining politics and economics um, in some form. Mm. When I graduated college, I actually applied to political science departments, PhD programs, and then went for a year to the London School of Economics to do a master's in economics. Mm -hmm. um, at the LSE, I did the sort of regular first year grad sequence and just loved that. It was a level of math that I actually hadn't done mm. uh, in my economics as an undergrad. And it sort of rekindled that. And I you know, remember checking out books on topology and teaching myself topology to better understand the second fundamental theorem of welfare economics and how it was mm. proven. 
And so once I was done with that year at BLC, I had an acceptance in the PhD program in the government department, but I knew I wanted to do economics. So when I came back to Harvard, um, it was officially doing a government PhD. I did uh, the economics classes again my first year and then applied to switch departments. Um, what was the government? Was that something in Kennedy or is that? Oh, the government's called, it's what we call political science. So it's just, oh. it's in the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. It's just a political science PhD. Mm-hmm. And I did get a, when I transferred, I'd had enough credits um, that I did get a terminal master's degree in political science. Oh, but, okay. But by then was, yeah. Oh, that's the AM on your... Oh, yeah. Yeah, AM, yeah. That's the AM. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Uh, got it. And so, uh, so I got that, but then uh, transferred over to the economics department. Mm, mm. So tell me about that. Tell me about the first year in, in Harvard, first year econ. Yeah, it was just, um, it was a lot of fun. Um, I, I think the, you know, you know I, most people at most schools are doing roughly the same micro macro econometrics um, sequence. And, you know, it's a bit of hazing, bit of, um, in some cases, some pretty abstract stuff um, related to, you know, theory and the like that you don't necessarily use again. Right. But I found it all pretty, um, yeah, pretty intrinsically um, interesting and fun. And, and, I, and I was not paying any attention to public policy then. I was not hanging out at the Kennedy School. I don't even remember sort of obsessively being aware of or paying attention to the debates over Clinton's budget plan in 1993 or, you know, things that I know super well, because I was started being involved a few years later and looked back. Um, I don't even really quite remember those events. Mm. In real time. I remember, you know, the classes I was, uh, you know, studying for and the topology I was learning. Mm. Well, so who, who taught you those micro macro econometrics that first year? Um, we had, um, it was, uh, Gary Chamberlain, uh, it was, uh, we had a couple of people and Jim Stock, uh, for sort of cross-section and time series, started with yeah. econometrics for you, Scott, um, for macro, it was Greg Mankiw, Robert Barrow, Ben Friedman, and John Leahy, oh, wow. and micro, I am embarrassed to not remember everyone, but, uh, I think Mass Kalel and Winston, I think they were both here and both teaching. I don't think I actually had Jerry Green. Um, uh-huh. we, use, we use their textbook. Wow. wow. Or their notes. I think it wasn't even a textbook yet. We use their notes. Yeah. Yeah. And they did a prelim that year, right? They still do it at Harvard. Yeah. 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 And so when you come out of that first year and you pass those prelims, well, now what are you thinking? What, what's it like at Harvard that I passed the prelims and now what is expected of the students? Or what did you understand the expectations to be like? Now I've graduated, taken my prelims. What's the rest of the the doctorate going to be like? And what do I have to do? Yeah, well, the second year you, you know, choose more classes. I did things in mostly macro finance, consumption, um, things adjacent to macro. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always liked my classes. I always liked problem sets. I did well at those. I would say it's really my third year. When you're done with your classes, you're thrown out into the wild, you know, all on your own. And I was interested in macro, but I didn't quite have somebody who I adopted or adopted me. I was working with different people in different ways and wasn't quite sure, yeah, exactly what to do uh, my research on. And that's when along came something I'd not been looking for at all, which was uh, my advisor said he had heard from Joe Stiglitz that they needed graduate students at the Council of Economic Advisors to go for a year. Mm-hmm. And in my head was, oh, you know, Greg Mankiw did this and Larry Summers and Paul Krugman, all these people did this. They generally did it for a year and they generally returned from it after a year with all sorts of great research ideas. And maybe yeah. this will be a way to, you know, help my research and give myself more research ideas. It was not really, a, you know, I want to go do public policy. Um, there's a personal part of it, too, which is there was this woman I really liked at the time and she was going to be in Washington and figured I would move there and and follow her wherever she was. And on um, that, I should say, as an aside, that part worked out because we're married today. Okay. Um, but um, so I went, you know, what, to Washington for what I thought was going to be just a year. And that's where I really discovered I just loved public policy. Mm-hmm. I loved seeing things I was working on affecting the world right away. 
I liked combining sort of economics and politics. I liked being able to communicate about economic ideas with non-economists and just all the different things. I really liked all of them. Yeah. I think I liked them in part because I had some comparative advantage yeah. in all of them. And so what was supposed to be a year in Washington, um, at the end of my first year, I remember calling Greg Mankiw and saying, you know, Greg, I'm going to stay another year. And he's like, that's a bad idea, but you know, it's not terrible. That's fine. I'll see you after another year. Um, after my second year, I wanted to stay even longer. And, you know, I, I think I was sort of almost too embarrassed to call him um, and ended up being in Washington for four years at uh, the Council of Economic Advisors, the National Economic Council, um, and the World Bank, working mm. on, you know, a whole range of things. And then ultimately the Gore campaign for a couple months mm. in 2000. And it was only Al Gore's losing that, um, you know, uh, I remember Greg actually sent me an email. Um, George Bush had campaigned on being an education president. And Greg's email to me was the first great thing, you know, George Bush is doing for education in our country is making sure you come back and finish your PhD. Yeah. How did you feel? Were you excited about doing that or was it? I mean, look, I was not excited about the outcome of that election. Sure. Um, I had worked hard and cared a lot. But yeah, I, I'm glad I was glad I was going back. I mean, at every stage. I said, you know, in six months, I'm going to go back and do my PhD. Yeah. But there's always, if you're in Washington, you know, I was saying things, I was briefing Al Gore for his debates. Mm. He would go into a debate and he would use lines I gave him and numbers I gave him and announce policies I had come up with. And I was... Um, what did that feel like? Know, 20, I was 29 and that just felt incredibly cool. And the idea yeah. that you could go back to like sitting in a corner working on your dissertation... Um, when like you could be talking to this person who might be president and like they'd be saying the things you told them to say, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was at every stage, I think I was making, you know, probably in retrospect, the right choice, but also the myopic one going with sort of what the biggest thrill, most exciting, highest impact thing was over the next six months without taking into account the combination of human capital and credential uh, that a PhD is that serves you well over a longer period of time. So you feel like the PhD in econ was valuable. I mean, cause I could imagine you, uh, uh, have, I mean, clearly you would have had a career had Gore one, you would have had a career, uh, in politics, but you're saying with that PhD and coming back around it, actually, you feel like was a different career. The one that, that yeah. you would have preferred. Yeah. If Gore had won, I think every year I would have said I'd go back. And I would have said that for four or eight straight years, at which point it probably would have been too late uh, yeah. to go back. Now, would that have been better or worse? Who knows? Right. Um, you know, my taste now, and we'll we'll get to this as we keep talking, are much more sort of pure policy and, and much less politics. I have my distaste for politics has grown over time. It's not a sort of moral point i think it's really important that there's some people who do politics and some yeah. people who compromise and some people who are in the mix of everything and i have huge respect for that and if everyone was a purist um you know nothing you know the world would be a worse place but my own personal taste and the role i want to play in the ecosystem now is one that doesn't internalize a whole lot of the politics and right so i do think you know it would be harder for me to have gotten back to where i am now without that as well well, how seamless was it to go back to Harvard, given that four-year gap? It was not seamless at all. It was actually hard. Really? Uh, all my friends from graduate school had finished and moved on to jobs. So it was a whole new group of people that yeah. I had to get to know. Yeah. I went from being the person briefing, you know, the vice president to being sort of sitting in the back of the room um, at the seminar and at first, I also tried to really stay involved in Washington stuff. Like there would be, I wrote like a few articles on, you know, why Bush's economic plan was bad. And people would have a conference call to strategize about what their counter tax reform proposal should be and how to develop the tax reform proposal. And I'd be on those conference calls. Um, and after about six months, Greg Mankiw, who by the way, has been a great mentor to me my whole life. Um, he said to me, 
that if I tried to do both things, I just wouldn't be able to do either of them well. Yeah. He recommended I basically go cold turkey on the Washington stuff, just not do any of it at all, just focus on grad school. Mm. And that was the only way um, to really do it well. And yeah. I took that advice and I basically told my friends, I'm still friends with you, but I'm just not going to be on the conference calls to come up with a tax reform plan because you know, life is long. I'll be able to do that later on. I'm just not going to do that for the next year or two or three. Did that feel like a sacrifice when Mankey told you to do well, that? It definitely felt like a sacrifice. I mean, I I, I, th- I think I thought he was obviously right at the time. I can't remember if I thought it at the time or in retrospect. And, and it wasn't in order, by the way. I mean, I was a free person. I could continue yeah. to do that if I wanted to. Um, he was giving me advice and I took his advice and it was, uh, you know, it was very good advice because, you know, the other part, and I tell people this is you just, you know, your career is going to be 40 years, you know, right. maybe longer. Right. Um, you can't just maximize the next 10 minutes of it. You want to think about um, how the whole thing is going to work. Right. Right. So, so, so it's, so it's a little bumpy. Do you end up working with uh, Dr. Mankey when you go back? Yeah, I worked with him. Um, I worked with John Leahy. We did papers together and I continued working with Joe Stiglitz, who I had worked with um, at both the CEA and is he at um, Columbia Roland. at this time when he's not in administration? Is he at, where is he? Is it Harvard or Columbia? I think he was at Columbia by then. Oh, okay. Okay. But he you're stayed, still, oh, you know, but you know what? He stayed, well, he stayed on at the World Bank, but yeah, no, then he left the World Bank and went to Columbia. Oh, okay. So, so you're still, so what do you end up doing your job market paper on? Um, I did it on, well, we should talk about the job market to be precise, um, but I was working on a paper actually on the zero lower bound in interest rates and what What? to do when you were at the zero lower bound. This is something I started in 2002. That's pretty early. It it was happening in Japan. Uh And, um, you know, I thought one day it could happen in the United States and one should be prepared and understand um, what the tools were. So that's what I was working on. Um, But then I got uh, sucked back into um, the political system and I thought it was just going to be briefly and it ended up being, um, you know, being sucked back for much longer and as a result, not going on the academic job market. Oh, so you graduate with the PhD on this job, this dissertation that's on the zero lower bound. Uh, well, yeah, there are a couple. I mean, like everyone, there's a couple of papers. So one is on uh, monetary policy spillovers to Canada, uh, one related to predicting financial crises and one related to um, sort of making in extent of indexation in the economy endogenous um, um, and the zero lower bound one actually I never uh, I didn't finish that one up I was working on it over the summer sort of heading into the job market and then that summer or September ended up um, going back on this different track yeah that just seems like really early in the zero lower bound stuff that I've seen it is right yeah, Gowdy Egerton was working on it then. I can't remember. I don't think he had published his stuff. Huh. But it just seemed like cool. Like, oh, yeah, interest totally. rates can go as high as you want, but they can't go as low as you want. Yeah. And, like this introduces this asymmetry. And most of our models are linear, which means they don't have some special thing around zero. But exactly. There is a special thing around zero. Oh. Um, yeah, I thought that was really fascinating. And that is cool. Exciting. So you go on, so you don't go, so you're saying you don't. So what happened? Yeah. So what happened was it was, uh, it was politics again. Um, The Democrats were in disarray in the primary in, in uh, 2003. Mm. And then Wes Clark, who had been the general um, overseeing the uh, war in Bosnia and the European theater, all of a sudden emerged as the sort of white knight of the Democratic Party, Um, somebody that I was good friends with and had worked with before, Ron Klain, who subsequently became chief of staff for Joe Biden. um, He said, you know, this person knows no economics. You know, he really needs to learn it. Can you just come to one thing to help prepare him? Yeah. And I said, you know, I'm busy. I'm going on the job market. I'm not going to do that. And he's like, it's so important. He's the one person. He has a shot at winning. And he's just really smart, but a total blank slate. His whole career has been in the military, never done this. And I said, fine, uh, you know, I'll come for a few hours. And so I flew down to Little Rock, spent the day with him, um, ended up really liking him and and just 
you know, I tried to call around and find other people to do this. I couldn't really find anyone else to do it. Um, now there's actually a lot of people that I think are quite good at both economics and understanding a certain amount of politics. I think there actually were fewer then for, I'm not sure why, but for whatever reason. So, um, you know, I ended up just getting sort of one more day, one more day, and just realizing, you know what, I just love doing this. And I think it's important and ended up being, uh, you know, joining his campaign. And once yeah. I did that, you know, knew I was delaying the job market probably in a, any conventional sense forever. You know, this is, this is because you've kind of like have, you know, been a little bit in the academic, you, you, you didn't go on the academic job market, but you have, it does feel like you kind of at least could articulate the feelings of it, you know, to, to someone that's never had, I mean, your career is actually, you know, the much smaller set of people that get the PhD in economics. And a lot of people that get the PhD in economics, they don't really have a lot of um, uh, role models or uh, even like paradigms, you know, for like, well, if I don't do this, I could do this. What they, if they have things, they're like, well, if I don't get the tenure track job, I could maybe get a teaching job or something. You know, they might, they might think still in terms of like different kinds of academia. And so what I was, this is a strange question, but I was like, what, what exactly, how would you describe to someone what it feels like? What are the feelings that you get and that you get in one and that you get in, a, in the other that would like make sense to someone who's never had this kind of career that you sort of ultimately yeah. chose? Yeah, I mean, I call it choose your own adventure. And at every stage, once you're not on the job market, you're just not really quite sure what's next mm -hmm. and how it's going to work. And there aren't 20 other people um, you can look at. But, um, you know, but it's not just me. I know a number of people that were super talented grad school students at top universities who just were not as motivated by research. And so they went straight to the Obama administration. Some of them I recruited to the Obama administration. And then when that ended, they went to think tanks in DC. Mm. And then some of them are still at think tanks. Some of them went into the Biden administration. And so there is a whole world out there of people who are doing economics, who are engaged mostly proximate to public policy, mm -hmm. who are not publishing in the top journals, but are thinking rigorously you know, in a different type of way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think of economics as an ecosystem. You know, mm -hmm. there's some people who are like, oh, all these people wasting their time on theory or all these people who do policy that don't know the theory or all these people, you know, they like don't like the different pieces of it. I think it all sort of fits together. And as long as different people are talking to each other um, and some people are spanning a range um, within that ecosystem, I think that ecosystem um, works well. But definitely the you know, job market assistant professor, associate professor, full professor is a um, route. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people have traveled and you know exactly the rules for, right. or mostly the rules for it. The go to government, go to a think tank, you know, do something else. Um, there's no real sort of rules for that. And I think it can be a little bit scary. Are there informal? It's worked for me, but it's not just, I, but I wouldn't, you know, I'm one person and a lot is luck and, and randomness and whatever else. Um, but I've seen it work for a lot of people. Well, so are there some rules, like some informal? I mean, there's obviously no like, you know, signaling mechanism that they like we came up with the AEA. But like, what are the what what kind of are the things that you've noticed that are like kind of successful rules? And what are some that are kind of like not very not not avenues into that career that you might think were? I don't know. Um, I mean, certainly in government, you know, working collaboratively is really important. I actually wasn't as good at that in the beginning. I sort of thought I knew more than some of the people around me and was probably a bit rude about it. Mm -hmm. Somebody took me aside once and said, it's not how smart you are. It's if you can't like work with people. Um, you're not going to get very far. Uh, and that was Gene Sperling gave me that advice, uh, who is an economic advisor to President Clinton. It was very good advice he gave me. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think being collaborative with others, I think, especially in government, this is not true of a think tank, just recognizing no one selected you because they wanted 
your full set of views on what should be done. They selected mm -hmm. you to help them fill in details to, you know, you can make a recommendation, you should do X, not Y, but if they say no, the president decided Y, then you figure out how to make Y better, or how to describe Y or, or, you know, whatever it is. So I think people who get a little bit overly grandiose about, you know, they should be the decider um, as opposed to understanding like staff is, is really a staff role. I think that can get in the way of people in government. Um, in think tanks, I think the biggest issue is you need to figure out how to create your own sources of rigor. I mean, most think tanks, you can just post something to the website, no matter how crappy it is. Um, and, you know, but if you do that a bunch, no one's going to trust you. And right. so you need to find like a peer review network. Here's the five people I'm going to send it to, and I'm not going to post it to the website until I hear back from those five people. Right. And so I, you know, I even do that now with op-eds. I'll often send them to a couple of people and mm -hmm. just get their opinions before I publish it. Cause mm. that's a sort of, you know, it's sort of weird. You can share your opinions with the world about like a vital pressing issue of the day mm -hmm. and like have no vetting whatsoever um, yeah. for, you know, beyond the copy editing at the newspaper. Right. right. Uh, so always try to build in sort of peer review networks. Yeah. Well, so when you look back uh, on your time in the Obama administration, what would you say were some of the highlights or some of the more memorable experiences that were like accomplishments or moments that just stand out as like really meaningful? Yeah, so I was more motivated by health reform than any other topic. I think it's first order importance for people. Um, I also think it's one of the most interesting and complicated things in economics because it has everything, adverse selection, moral hazard, externalities, behavioral issues, uh, competition issues, et cetera. It's all there um, in, in that one area. And so I did a lot of work on the Affordable Care Act. I basically headed up the tax side for the administration, both the tax increases that were paying for it and also um, you know, a certain amount of the way in which it was implemented um, as a tax. I was in a, the room with President Obama for all of the negotiations between the House and the Senate as they were trying to reconcile um, their two bills. And I was in the chamber of the House um, in Nancy Pelosi's box as her guest when um, the final passage was voted on. So for me, uh, that was far and away um, the most thrilling thing I did. Um, and, you know, some of that was economics. A lot of that was sort of a little bit like politics, negotiating, you know, being the technical person in that context. Um, later on, when I, in the second term, I went on to chair the Council of Economic Advisors and in that context, you know, we were getting less legislation done. And so both weighing in on um, a lot of different regulatory issues, whether it was climate change or other issues, um, but also trying to turn CEA into just sort of thought leadership on issues of um, competition, the decline in labor force participation, flexible workplaces, how better to read macro data, I just thought we had this great platform, an amazing set of economists. And if we did credible, serious research, even if it wasn't instantly related to a policy issue that second, that, um, you know, it could make a difference over time. Is that common for the CEA to have to like, you know, flexibly sort of modify its charter almost or like what it's going to be there? Because it's like in an academic department, you know, it doesn't seem it's kind of more exogenous, but it sounds like you're sort of describing some endogeneity. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I think it'd be fair to say we did a larger number of reports, speeches, et cetera, under me than would probably be ever the case um, for a three and a half year period of time in the council. I mean, I think we did sort of, I wouldn't be surprised if it was four times the pace of all of that uh, than was normally the case. Um, and CEA sometimes does reports of like, the president just announced this policy, here's why it's great. And mm -hmm. those are good and those are important. And we did some of those, but I found it more interesting to find things that were a little bit orthogonal that could help you get ahead of the debate. So mm. a lot on competition where we didn't have a competition policy. And then we announced a competition policy in part because of the research and work um, that we had done. So I think it's definitely more interesting to do, you know, find evidence and have it lead you to a new policy mm -hmm. rather than the policy's been announced, let's go find the best evidence for it. Yeah. But, you know, at CEA, you're always doing a mixture of both of those. Yeah. 
So if so if this is kind of a question. So if if you could talk to like an alien from outer space and he doesn't understand, uh, he cares about the human experience, but he doesn't really understand these two jobs because to him they're all just jobs. Ha having transitioned from your roles in public service and policy back into academia at the Kennedy School, how would you describe to this alien how your life as an economist has changed? What would you tell him have been the trade-offs and the, the, the gains? So, you know, for me, I had eight years in the Obama administration. I began with the financial crisis as just a terrifying thing you know, emerged with the economy in pretty good shape, the unemployment rate low and falling, inflation stable, et cetera. I'm not saying things were perfect, but you really got to see things repaired. Um, that to me felt like a beginning, middle and end of a certain saga. And I was really happy to embark um, on a new one. Yeah. And, you know, I love teaching. Teaching isn't in some ways that different from the White House. I mean, I tell my students that the people I worked with in the White House were really smart and didn't necessarily know a lot of economics. Mm -hmm. If I just asserted to them, economics says X, they wouldn't believe me. But if I said, oh, if the price goes up, it'll be harder for people to afford, so they'll buy less of it. So then they'll buy more of this other thing. And there was once this study they did in France when that happened, and it showed this. And they're like, oh, wait, I can follow the logic. I understand that. Maybe I believe you. And so I think teaching intro economics and engaging with people in the White House, there's a lot of continuity. Mm. Um, you know, there's been more continuity in terms of engagement on public issues than I planned. Um, you know, I get sort of, you know, more press calls every day now than, than I thought I'd be getting at this stage of life and probably mm. even than I wanted to get. I mean, I'm happy to, I think. Uh, there's so many great reporters and and I and I love talking to them and I don't I don't care whether or not I'm quoted. I like to, you know, uh, help them understand things better, or at least help them understand the way I see things. They can decide whether or not that's better um, or not. So there's been a little bit more sort of rapid fire. I wouldn't have thought like, oh, the day of a Fed meeting, I have to look ahead and make sure my schedule is a bit free that day because there'll be phone calls and tweeting. Um, but then there's also just you know, seminars I go to that I'm not sure what the point of them is in the next 10 minutes, or I'm not going to use it right away, but, you know, meet new people and learn new things. And it comes in handy um, later on. And then, you know, done things like analyzing the um, Trump tax cuts. I was having a debate with one of my most conservative colleagues, Robert Barrow, mm -hmm. and we started on email. The debate continued over coffee and culminated in writing a paper together oh, that wow. helped us work through, you know, what his perspective was, what mine were. And the original plan for the paper was that we said, you know, we'd come up with two sets of estimates and we'd crosswalk them so people could at least understand why we thought the different things we thought. We were so close on all the parameters that we had a featured estimate that we both agreed on. Mm. Um, and then we did something that I haven't really noticed before in an economics paper. Um, our conclusion was split. Half of it was labeled by him and half of it was labeled by me. And it explained why, even though we had the same analysis of the tax cut, he supported it and I opposed it. And a lot of that conclusion was normative, which our, you know, our work wasn't normative. It was an input um, into normative things. So I like being able to yeah, step back and spend you know, much more time and, and, you know, and, and do it with people with a, a pretty diverse set of thoughts and, yeah. and backgrounds. Yeah. Well, it's top of the hour. So I have kind of a, uh, one last, uh, wrap up question. Um, you know, a lot of people think of demand curves. They think of it as you sort of mentioned it as price goes up, quantity demanded goes down, but you know, the demand curve also represents the, the, the marginal benefit that a person gets from a good. And so if you're at the, when you think of the diamond water paradox, the reason why water is really cheap is because you drink a lot of it. And um, so I, I sort of think of advice like that. There's sometimes there's a lot of advice that we get that we've gotten so much of it it's really, really important advice, but we've gotten so much of it. We're at the bottom of the demand curve on it. And so, you know, but, but people don't always know that when they're giving it to you, uh, they don't know that you've heard this 10,000 times. Um, but if you're at the top of the demand curve, 
advice on the top of the demand curve sort of seems like, you know, that's the advice that a lot of people need, which is stuff they haven't heard. Uh, that's really valuable, but they haven't heard a lot of it. And I was just kind of wondering now that you've sort of, you know, you, you've had a very full, interesting career that, you know, I think has given you a perspective and probably there's a lot of high marginal benefit, high top of the demand curve stuff that you could share uh, with, with people. What, what would you like to share as we conclude our conversation with aspiring economists or public policy experts that you've learned along the way that you think has high marginal benefit? Yeah. So first of all, I mean, one thing I'd say is actually maybe don't take too much advice from people that won the lottery. You know, you see somebody that won the lottery and you're like, oh, how'd you pick your numbers for the lottery? What was your strategy? Like, how can I pick numbers just like you picked numbers? Um, you know, if you look at anyone, certainly me at least, um, you know, there's a set of things that uh, that were lucky along the way. Um, so I do advise people in part to you know, try to look at something where they've seen a number of people proceed through that path. And mm. if the second or third best thing works out at each stage, that uh, life is going to be good. Um, life is going to be satisfying is sort of one piece of advice. Um, another is just sort of think about 40 years and, uh, you know, what you're going to be doing for 40 years. And yes, if you have this thing that's just amazingly exciting, you know, often I'll be giving advice to people who want to work in the White House. No one's going to work in the White House for 40 years. You have to have something you think is good and exciting and meaningful to you for the, you know, 38 years you're not working in the White House, or for most people, the 40 years yeah. uh, of your career that you're not um, working in the White House. And um, then, um, you know, the, the last thing I'd say is with economics, yeah, I, I think the sort of, not just economics, I mean, I get a lot of students who come to me who really want to do good in the world. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, you know, if like going to like the desert and handing out food to people is the number one best thing in the world, but you're going to get like really hot and tired and bored and stop doing it after six months, you're just not going to do that much good. So yeah. if you do the fifth best thing for the world and you love it and you right. probably love it because you're good at it and you're probably good at it because you love it, right. um, you can do that for 40 years, do that. Uh, and there's just not one answer and one best thing. It really does have to be something um, you love and you're good at. And for me, I sort of have uh, discovered that and that's evolved over time as well. So I guess that was lots of piece of advice, but I think the most important was to not take advice from me. <laughs> not take advice from you. Unless we watch five Jason Furman's do the same thing you did, then we can, then, then we can listen. Uh, exactly. You, you have four <laughs> out of five. Four and five. Great. Well, it's such a pleasure to, to meet you and to hear your story. I really appreciate you uh, letting me bother you today and uh, and listen to more about what your life's been like. Um, it was great uh, meeting you. You've been just such a positive force in like, educating so many people about, uh, you know, it's such a really important area in economics and have endless energy and it, it awes me. So excited to spend a little bit of time with you too. Thanks. All right. Well, good luck with everything. I, I'm expecting uh, if you get another call from the White House, I'll be uh, curious what, what decisions you make then. All right. Bye-bye. Gotta see you soon. Honey, you need me. Baby, I